Hello, everybody. This is John Morgan, a marketing manager at TMC. Um, welcome to our webinar, Stacking Vibration Isolation Systems, the Do's and Don'ts. Um, just a couple of notes here. Uh, we have a lot of attendees, so uh, everybody is on mute for the moment. But we do want to get questions, uh, which we'll address at the end. So if you could go to the chat box and type in uh, any questions you might have. Um, we'll be happy to answer them um, when Mike finishes his presentation. Um, so for now, I will turn it over to uh, Mike Georgialis, who is our uh, North American sales manager. Mike. All right. Thanks, John. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining today's webinar and uh, also good evening and uh, good afternoon for anybody joining from uh, from overseas. Uh, Mike Dorjalis, I'm the North American Sales Manager here at TMC. I've got a background in physics and I've been doing uh, vibration control now for about 10 years. Uh, so I'd like to um, share a little bit of what I've learned and what we've learned here over the years on uh, how to properly stack uh, vibration isolation systems. You know, there's a lot of uh, 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 nuances to getting uh, optimized performance when combining the effective transfer functions of two systems. So um, we get these kind of questions a lot and, and I'll, I'll just get started. So I wanted to set the stage by talking a little bit about the types of problems we're trying to solve and the types of instruments that are affected by uh, uh, floor vibration. And we'll do a brief crash, crash course on sources of vibration. So where does this vibration come from? What are we really talking about when we talk about vibration uh, that we're trying to, trying to solve by stacking systems here? Then we're going to go a little deeper, talk about what are isolators and the different types of isolation systems that we're going to be addressing. And so you know, all of these things set the foundation for, well, what happens when you start combining these isolation systems? And in our, in our, and in our isolation section, we're going to learn a little bit about what a passive isolator is and what an active isolator, what an active isolator is, what damping is, and how, um, and when you, and 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 different types of active isolators. And then finally, we'll get into our do's and don'ts in the conclusion. Uh, once we've sort of covered all of the uh, pros and cons and and technical nuances of all these uh, different configurations. So ultra precision, that's a word we use that's out there uh, that was coined by uh, the NIST, the National Institute of, Institute of Standards and Technology. And the idea behind what we call ultra precision is really this marching forward of time where, uh, where in basically all industries, tolerances get tighter and tighter and tighter. And we see this, for example, in um, uh, the, the auto industry is a good example where, you know, an automobile from the 70s or 80s or 60s even uh, would have been a lot of work to maintain, a lot of maintenance. Uh, but uh, as Toyota got into some of the success quality standards uh, from, the, from the 70s and 80s moving on, uh, really pioneering tighter tolerances, what we start seeing is engine parts fitting better, closer together, um, less wiggle and friction between components and smoother running, and then therefore less maintenance on automobiles. So now today, cars are far more efficient, they last longer, and they require a lot less maintenance than, than cars back in the day. And that's that's one of the examples of tolerances getting tired over time, the tolerance of engine components and other mechanical components on cars. But another good example is from the semiconductor industry where uh, Gordon Moore, who uh, may he rest in peace, just passed away, coined, uh, coined Moore's law. You know, he was the founder of Intel and one of the founders of Intel. And he said, well, in the semiconductor industry, what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to double the unit of transistor, double the number of transistors per unit area on a silicon wafer uh, every two years. And that is sort of what we've been doing. And that's what Moore's law here is, is generated, is, it, 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 it is representing where microprocessors are getting more and more sensitive every two years. And that's why we see uh, one modern cell phone today having more processing power in it than all the supercomputers in the world back in the 60s. And also why, you know, in 1980 and 1990, you had multiple devices to do many different things where now all of that processing power and all of those functionalities all are in your, in your cell phone. 
And so the key is in ultra precision, in the world of ultra precision, is as you try to get things smaller and smaller and perform uh, higher, higher resolution type measurements, you get, um, you, you, you start to see vibration becoming more and more of a limiting factor in the amount of resolution you can achieve. So here's an example of some of the ultra precision instruments that we're talking about. We've got a few of them. In the nanotech nanofab field, we're looking at scanning electron microscopes, transition electron microscopes. We're looking at uh, NMRs. We're looking at um, advanced microscopy equipment like confocal and single photon microscopes. In the photonics industry, we're looking at petawatt lasers and long light path experiments. And uh, very common in the semiconductor manufacturing field, we're looking at sort of the wafer inspection, uh, failure analysis, all sorts of inspection instruments that are being used. And when we talk about the size of, of the features that folks are trying to resolve, we're thinking about uh, you know the micro level. When you say micro, micrometer, for example, that that you take um, one human hair and you section that lengthwise ten times, you get to a micrometer. When you get uh, uh, to the nanometer level, you want to do 10,000 sections, uh, and uh, you know you slice a human hair 10,000 times uh, lengthwise. Now we're starting to talk about some of the features that we're start trying to look at. And so, how does vibration cause you a problem? Well, this is uh, a couple images from a scanning electron microscope, and what we're looking at here is just a test sample of some gold particles, some some sprayed gold particles, and um, what you see are these ripples and vibrations. Uh, sort of uh, static in the image, and that's a telltale, telltale characteristic of, uh, of floor vibration and sometimes magnetic field distortion in a, in a scanning electron microscope image. And here's another couple examples where um, in, this, uh, in this sample here, you've got those ripples, but uh, another good example comes from the semiconductor industry on the right here, where uh, the intended functionality of the instrument that generated this, this image um, well, I should say the, of, the inst of the instrument that generated the sample of which this image is taken is uh, we should be seeing straight, very even, clear lines, but instead it's just sort of this mismatch of dots and, and, and mess, and that was all due to uh, floor vibration. So where does floor vibration come from? And where does, well, and well, it comes from a lot of different places. And we see this very critical, especially in the low frequency range, which I'll speak to, which I'll speak about a little bit later. Um, but uh, but it's very common for low frequency floor vibration to exist in the ground, in soil, in large massive buildings, and it's caused by people walking in a building. It's caused by uh, light rail traffic. It's caused by subways going overneath, even airplanes going overhead. Uh, buildings swaying in the wind, construction in facilities, uh, and even um, there's even a, uh, a, a, a geological phenomena called the um, called the microseismic peak, which is the sum of all the waves uh, of all the oceans crashing on all the all the shores all the same, at all the same time. And and if you can measure that with a sensitive enough geophone to measure that microseismic peak at about half a hertz, which is you know once every two seconds or so. And what we have um, here uh, is 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 are very noisy uh, environments that 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 have a lot of mechanical uh, vibration coming in. Um, another thing to note is vibration exists vertically and horizontally, and um, when we think about a building, for example, swaying in the wind, well, you might be looking uh, at a top floor and see that and measure that vibration as a horizontal left, right, or front, back type vibration. But, uh, uh, but it could also exist vertically as tension on the walls of the building as they join the floor cause what we call a drum head effect. And that sort of torsional mo mode on the corners of a, fl uh, of, a, of a building as they meet a floor can actually, uh, move one moving back and forth, uh, can cause that floor to actually move up and down. And what's also interesting is vibration is sort of a standing wave, if you want to think about it that way. Um, it's, uh, it, it exists, and you can measure it very, very differently in very different locations. You know, you've got peaks, and you've got valleys, and you've got nodes. And uh, you know they can measure, so it can it can vary a thousand times from from location to location. 
Another, another challenge that we're not going to get into in this one, but uh, you've got to be able to, uh, to distinguish it from other sources. The acoustics and barometric noise, uh, so this is noise in the air, it's audible noise, but also noise from pressure changes in the room, like uh, somebody opening a door uh, very rapidly or an HVAC system turning on and off in a large volume of air, suddenly being sucked in or uh, sucked out or being pulled into a room. Um, even an elevator going up and down a shaft could be a cause of, a, of, a, of an inaudible uh, acoustic or barometric noise. A really good example of acoustic or barometric, uh, a really good example of a barometric noise is, is um, say, if you've ever been sitting in your car and somebody opens maybe one of the back windows and it's the only window open in the car and you start to get this rapid uh, pressure wave that you could feel in your ears and it's very uncomfortable. That's a you know, roughly a 30 hertz standing wave that's been created in the cavity of the car due to that, that one window being open. And that's a classic example of a barometric type noise. We also see a lot of other resonances being introduced when we're starting to look at systems that have vibration uh, sensitivity, like the resonances of the tool's own vibration isolation system. So if the instrument that you're looking at has its own vibration cancellation systems built into it, which many do, um, you might see resonances and noise generated from that system, but also pumps, fans, robotics, moving stages, and things like that, and the payload when the instrument itself also generate vibration. So it's important to remember that different vibration sources require different mitigation approaches. Um, and today we're gonna be focusing primarily on floor vibration, but you'll see that some of the stacking applications that we're talking about actually involve some onboard cancellation systems as well. So when we uh, are thinking about isolators, um, there are way that we, they're the way that we solve vibration problems. And what an isolator effectively is meant to do, it's meant to provide a transfer function. And in a very, very simple sense, uh, it's an isolation factor. It's a reduction of what's measured or the level of vibration that is coming in from the floor to what is measured once it passes through that system and then measured on top of the system. So this, you have this transfer function or this ratio of input to output. And that's really what you're trying to achieve. You're trying to reduce it by some factor. And most isolation systems, in fact, all isolation systems uh, have, have a frequency dependent isolation factor. And a very common frequency dependent isolation factor looks uh, like this over on the right hand side. And if you look at this chart, what I'm pointing, what, what I'm showing is um, a, a, a the typical transfer function curve where you have a line in the center, which we'll call unity, and anything above the line uh, is, is amplification of the input from the floor. Anything below the line is isolation of the input from the floor. And a typical undamped isolator will always have some sort of resonant peak. And in this theoretical case, we've got a resonant peak of about 100 times amplification at one hertz. And then a very fast roll off where as frequency increases, you get better and better and better isolation. And down to 100 hertz, you are you know, at roughly 100 times, nearly 100% cancellation. So you can extreme, you, you know, of course these are asymptotic, so it's, it's never really that, but, um, but, you are, but you can get very, very, very high levels of cancellation using very, very soft, and when I say soft, I mean low resonant frequency isolators. So that's great, but amplification is a problem. 100 times amplification of a one hertz motion, uh, one hertz input can be quite problematic for a lot of instruments. Um, so, especially since one hertz is a very, very common and it's a low frequency uh, 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 factor we see due to some of the effects that I mentioned before. So what do we do? We try to, uh, to get rid of that amplification, we can add in what's called damping. And as we dampen an isolator, we add some sort of friction component or some sort of mechanically shorting component that restricts the motion of the isolator, but doesn't let too much, uh, too much additional I, I, uh, no mechanical energy through. And so a damped isolator looks like this over up on the right-hand corner, 
where you've got your completely undamped spring, but then you put something in there that might add some friction. Maybe it's an oil or maybe it's some sort of soft mechanical component or it could be a, a foam or something like that. Once you start damping an isolator, you can start to dampen out its resonant frequency, but there's always gonna be some mechanical energy that's gonna to wanna to transfer through that isolator. So as you damp your resonant frequency, you start sacrificing performance at higher frequencies. And the more you damp, like here, you've got this damping factor of Q3, you've all of a sudden sacrificed quite a bit of high frequency isolation. So when we try to, so there's always a compromise. And what we try to achieve when damping an isolation system is an isolation system that's critically damped, that doesn't resonate, resonate too much, but still also provides you performance at higher frequencies. And the way we achieve that, and the curve that I just talked about, uh, and pretty much the industry standard and, and many, many uh, other industries use these types of passive damped isolators, is we use uh, passive vibration isolators, which, have, which function like damped mass springs. And it's a simple free body diagram. And in this case, and most of the isolators we'll be talking about moving forward on the, um, on, uh, on the presentation today, uh, are these types of uh, gimbal piston style air isolators where you have uh, a piston uh, uh, in, a, in a piston well that's then supported by a pressurized air chamber. So you get a six degree of freedom, um, very low mechanical contact sort of floating system. And they're sealed air chambers with, which are very, very soft and they have roughly a two hertz resonance. And to give people a feel for, if you've not been around something like an optical table or an isolated lab bench, um, two hertz resonance is also very, very similar to um, the resonance of your car spring. So if I were to go to you know, your car and start pressing on the bumper of your car and driving it up and down, that's actually a soft, roughly two hertz uh, 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 rate at which you could drive your car springs at the resonant frequency. Um, but uh, one thing that's a, that you should note is, note your car doesn't go up and down. It doesn't, it doesn't continue to oscillate as you drive it. It will always stop. And that's because you've got your shock system in the car. So you have your springs and you have your shocks and your shocks are your damper, which are allowing that, uh, that, low, that, that, that lower resonant curve and stopping that motion, uh, but then passing higher frequency noise from whatever you're going out over the floor, or I'm sorry, over the road as you drive. So, this is a kind of isolator, it's an industry standard, it's used in a lot of mechanical instruments, a lot of uh, high, high, high sensitivity and uh, ultra precision instruments, but it's limited in that it's got a resonant frequency that needs to be somehow managed. And, um, and, if, and if you need more vibration isolation, you really can't get anything more other than, uh, 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 because you're always balancing this resonance versus high frequency isolation. So if you need to improve the level of uh, isolation that you get, you have to start thinking about uh, active isolation systems. When we talk about active isolation systems, we're talking about electromechanical systems that have three key components. You wanna be looking at, you wanna be thinking about a motion sensor, you need to have a force actuator, and you need to have some sort of control loop. And what's effectively happening is you've got a sensor that senses some motion, you've got that control system feeding back to your loop, and you've got some actuator trying to cancel out what's sensed by the sensor. And when you start thinking about all these different types of components and these electromechanical components, you can start to get creative with the types of architecture that you can have these uh, components in, uh, what types of configurations that, uh, that are possible. And your first, um, uh, type, which is going to be one that we'll definitely be focusing on later, is the serial type isolation system, uh, which typically in a serial system, you'll see piezoelectric actuators. Uh, there's going to be stiff springs as a passive component to it as well. And then one of the examples is a product that we make um, called the uh, Quiet Island, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later, and that's a serial type system. Uh, parallel type systems use uh, feedback control. Uh, they also have, but they use linear motors and they use uh, pneumatic, uh, or they, you can also control them uh, through pneumatic controls because a lot of these uh, systems are pneumatic based. Uh, you can add feed forward uh, to provide some additional control and you can add, uh, um, but, uh, and uh, we also make parallel type systems called electrodamp uh, and, and all TMCs uh, basically uh, anybody that's competing with TMC offers a, a parallel type system. So we were the only ones that make uh, serial type systems, but that's uh, beside the point. Um, the next uh, 
Uh, the next slide that I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about, well, how these systems are actually configured and how they work. And so we'll start with parallel type systems, which is by far the most commonly produced uh, active cancellation system. And we're going to be looking at this free, di free body diagram, with which contains all the components that I had mentioned. When you think about your mass here, this is your isolated payload. So here is usually some sort of platform or some sort of surface. And sitting on top of the surface is going to be whatever instrument that you're trying to isolate, a scanning electron microscope. A, um, uh, it could be any number of highly sensitive instruments, a uh, transmission electron microscope, a, uh, some sort of sensitive optical setup, any sort of the op anything that I mentioned before. Also on the payload or near the payload and at the top of this platform, you have your sensor. And what the sensor is going to do is it's going to sense any vibration that comes up from the, uh, th the transfers up through these isolators. It's a damp spring isolator. So you're going to get some vibration transfer uh, to, the, to the payload proportionate to the, um, proportionate to the transfer function of, of these components. And the sensor is going to want to sense that and going to want to stay at zero. That's really the key uh, for any sort of uh, 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 feedback control system is that you have this signal error and you want to minimize that signal error and, and basically keep that error to zero. So you want that steady state. So it's going to send to a controller uh, some, uh, some signal and the controller is going to condition that signal and in the most basic terms possible, flip that signal equal and opposite to, um, to what's being sensed on the sensor and then send out uh, send to the actuator some sort of cancellation. Um, some sort of cancellation force. And these systems kind of have the ability to work pretty well. And, but the biggest limitation of the system is that you've got a spring here, which has, as I had mentioned in a previous slide, some sort of high resonant frequency. I'm sorry, well, a high amplitude resonant frequency at low uh, at a low resonant frequency. So you've got roughly two hertz resonance at this at this point here, always being amplified. So in all cases in a parallel type system, you've got this amplification that's being fed into the sensor that it's constantly trying to cancel out. At the same time, you have the sensor on the payload. So there's payload motion going on, uh, which could be acoustics coupling into the frame. It could be um, user activity on there, on, on the platform or things like that. Well, all that information is also going into the sensor and you start to achieve, uh, you start to get to a place where um, a lot of information is going into the sensor and it's gonna want to cancel everything that, it, that, it, that, it, that it's sensing. And as you try to cancel more and more information going into the sensor, you start coming to bandwidth limitations of the system. So in order to achieve stability, you need to start to detune or reduce the performance of your feedback control loop so that, um, so that all of that input can be managed by the system and it stays stable. So you have to start to reduce the performance in order to achieve stability in a parallel type system. Now it can be done and lots of highly tuned systems uh, work, uh, work really well in the field, but what we've seen in practice as, and especially in volume, um, uh, the, 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 the level of performance that's achievable uh, uh, starts to become uh, uh, something that is actually more well suited to uh, onboard motion cancellation and forgetting about what's going on on the floor. So that onboard uh, 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 can cancellation of say a moving stage or a robotic arm, which I'll talk about a little later, these types of systems are very, very well suited for because they sense that onboard motion, they have cancellation forces and you can achieve very, very good performance of, of known onboard um, uh, noise. But the combination of onboard noise plus floor noise becomes problematic for these systems. And this is the type of transmissibility curve you see in a typical parallel type system where you might have uh, this amplification. Here's your unity line. You've got this amplification at one hertz. Uh, you've got a rapid roll off and then you've got what, what's generally expected of most passive type systems, uh, passive base type systems, you know, pretty good performance at higher frequencies. But the key is this amplification here, which is due to that, that internal resonance of the system. And so you're spending a lot of bandwidth, a lot of system energy canceling out its own resonance. In a serial type system, we take these same components, but we 
organize them in a little bit of a different way. And we add a third component. And the free, free body diagram on the right, which is only in the Z direction, I should mention that both of these systems have these performance in X, Y, and Z. So uh, they're three dimensional uh, systems, uh, but I'm showing just one dimensional free body diagrams just for simplicity. We introduce the piezoelectric stack. And the piezoelectric stack is the load bearing member of the system, but it's also the actuator which is a very fundamental difference from the parallel type system where the load bearing member is a soft spring with a high resonance, and then the actuator is a linear motor or some sort of a pneumatic control system. With the actuator being the primary load member, being a high stiffness primary load bearing member of the system, you, have your, you can then introduce a new component, which we call the inner mass. This inner mass lives inside the isolator and your system, your, 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 your sensor, which is either a geophone or acceler accelerometer, lives on the inner mass. And then we can provide a second stage of isolation, which is then a passive system that then directly supports the payload on top. So what we've achieved here by using a high stiffness uh, 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 piezoelectric stack as well uh, to be both the actuator and primary load-bearing member of the system is a feedback control loop that benefits from the passive isolator on the inner mass that supports the payload. And the benefit is payload noise. So people working on the payload, pumps, fans, acoustics, uh, anything that's going on in the payload is filtered to a high degree by the elastomer spring here and not introduced into the feedback control system. And what that allows you to do is take that feedback control system and with so much less input being on this very, very quiet inner mass here, you are, you are able to provide much more advanced levels of tuning of the control loops to achieve in particular, very, very strong levels of low frequency uh, vibration cancellation. And you start to get a curve that looks like this, where it's, it's, it's hard to compare, so I'll jump to the next one, I'll jump to the one where they're both on one page. And you start to see the blue curve of a serial type system, where at one hertz, for example, you're at 50% isolation, where in the parallel type system, the best you can hope for is some amplification at one hertz, and you don't get to 50% until three or four uh, hertz over here. Now, it is true that there's gonna be some elect, some resonance as well in the serial type system, but what we've done is we've shifted this resonance very, very far back. And the reason for this resonance is not because there's any inherently soft components of the system. This is actually uh, more like uh, a very, very, very low electronic uh, drift of the system, which translates as really rigid body motion and generally doesn't cause a problem with extremely um, high sensitivity tools. Unlike a resonance at a slightly higher frequency, which will uh, match the resonances of a, of, of, a, of, a, of a tool's internal isolator, which I'm gonna be getting into more detail now. So now that we've got a little bit of a background on what types of isolation systems we're talking about. Let's talk about how we can stack them. And the key thing to think about when stacking isolation systems is you've got to have, you've got to figure out a way to make the top system compatible, compatible with the bottom system effectively. And you get this multiplying tilt effect uh, on these, um, on, on stack systems where, where your center of mass is going to want to tilt back and forth due to disturbance and it's on some sort of isolation system. Well, if you start stacking two isolation systems, you're going to get an exponent, uh, a, you know, the compounding factor of both systems. So you get the summing of the transfer functions and two things happen when you start summing transfer functions. Well, if they're in phase, you get extremely high, you get, you get basically double the resonance. 
uh, if they're similar to stiffness systems. If they are out of phase, then you get instability. So you can't really win either way. So when we're looking at ways to stack systems, we have to achieve one of two, um, one of two conditions. And you can stack active systems on active systems. You can stack passive systems on active systems. You can stack passive systems on passive systems. And I forgot to mention you can also stack passive system, active systems on passive systems, which I'll go through an example of each one of those uh, in the next slides. But at, at a fundamental level, you either need to, if you're going to stack a system, you need to have one of two things. You need to have either a separation of mass or a separation of stiffness. Now, in the separation of mass, you have some, um, some sort of lower mass system that's on some isolator of a given resonant frequency, we should say, or K, which is stiffness, which is the inverse of resonance. And then, and then you place this assembly on a much larger mass, uh, at least 10 times larger. And then that mass is supported by the uh, a similar level, a similar stiffness. So if you have, say, an air isolator supporting your instrument, and then you have an air isolator supporting a large mass, like a big concrete plinth, as they say, uh, then uh, then then you'll be then you won't experience the instability that can be caused by coupling of those two springs of similar resonant frequency. But you will get a doubling of that resonance. So those similar uh, similar frequency springs will double their resonance. How to avoid that? You can use, you can achieve another uh, condition, which is the separation of stiffness. And in separation of stiffness, you have your two masses, which doesn't matter if they're very different from one another, but if you use two springs of different stiffnesses or different spring constants, you've got a mismatch of resonant frequencies. And the mismatch resonances, if they're far enough apart, results in the, uh, the systems not being able to couple or, uh, or, or interfere with one another. And there's a benefit to a separation of stiffness in that you really don't need to have a large mass. And you can then uh, provide, uh, uh, use that in an active system to provide a much more bandwidth for low frequency cancellation. So let's talk about different ways to stack systems. And when I look at the first, uh, the, the first way, I'm thinking about a passive on passive type system. And in a passive on passive example, uh, you've got a, a large concrete block. So what we're looking at in this photo is an optical table. This is a standard uh, optical table. Uh, it's pretty common in most uh, photonics labs or neuroscience labs or quantum computing labs. And um, you've got a frame with some air isolators. You can see the air isolators uh, uh, from the frame and they're supporting this optical table. And then this optical table is sitting on this floor, but this isn't a floor. This is actually a floating plinth. And this is a T-shaped floating plinth that weighs about 25,000 pounds. And I've outlined it in red here. And you can see down here uh, the pneumatic isolator um, for, the, for the system. Now, what kind of uh, performance are we seeing from this system? Well, the first thing that was done uh, was the optical table on top was deflated because what was immediately noticed when uh, trying to work on this table was that the air isolators in the table were summing with the resonance of the air isolators in the plinth, despite the fact that there was 25,000 pounds of mass in between the two systems. And what I don't have is measurements of the air uh, of the of the table inflated, but if I did have an inflated table, you would see the effects. And let me talk about what we're looking at here uh, before I go any further. So we've got three measurements that we've taken. 
we have a measurement of the floor. So this is the floor here uh, uh, on the bottom here. We have a measurement on top of the plinth, which is here. And we've taken a measurement on top of the optical table, which is here. And what you see here is some floor uh, behavior, which is pretty typical. We've got um, you know between 100 nanometers per, se per second uh, and one nanometer per second here in this low frequency range. Uh, but when I go to take my measurement on top of my plinth, I can clearly see the resonance of those isolators at roughly 1.6 hertz. Now the green, and that's the blue line. Now the green line represents on top of the table. So we see roughly a one-to-one -one transfer function on top of the table at low frequencies. But if that table was inflated, what you'd see was an even higher green peak there, which, uh, um, which we can talk about later. Uh, but then the kind of performance that you're seeing uh, on here is very, very typical of what you would see for the transfer function of, uh, uh, of those isolators that are supporting the plinth, these red ones down here. You see that resonance at low frequencies, and then you see that drop off at higher and higher, higher frequencies, and more and more separation uh, between what's measured on the floor and what's measured on the, uh, on the top of the plinth as you go further along. Uh, but then if you look at the green uh, line, you see basically rigid body behavior up until 12.5 hertz and 20 hertz, where you start to see a lot more noise. And these are resonances that are in the table itself. So it's a deflated optical table, and it's probably got some instruments on it, and various other things are coupling on it. And what you're starting to see here are the effects of those other things going on on this de deflated optical table. So now let's talk about a system with passive isolators being placed on an active system. And what we're going to be looking at are, uh, is a really good example of a scanning electron microscope. And um, it's a very common uh, application for something with air isolators that might go on an active system. And just a quick crash course on what, uh, what we're talking about when we talk about the different components of the system is uh, I'm looking at a fib instrument. This is a typical uh, Helios-type instrument made by Thermo Fisher Scientific. And if I break that down into its critical components, you've got uh, a column with a source that's shooting an E-beam to a sample into a vacuum chamber. And this entire assembly here is support is, is what's desired to be isolated. And it's, it's isolated by typical piston-style pneumatic isolators. And you've got some sort of stiff frame here, which is going to have you know, covers and electronics and all sorts of instrumentation uh, inside the frame here. And I want to digress for a moment to talk about die springs because the die spring is the type of spring being used in the parallel system in this example, as opposed to a pneumatic uh, type spring. But uh, when I say die spring, it's a metal spring and it's a passive isolator. And here's an example of a resonance of a, of a typical damp die spring. And the thing that I want to take away here that's going to be important for the interpretation of the data on the next, on the data, on the next slides is the difference in the uh, resonant frequencies when measured horizontally versus measured vertically. You can see the horizontal uh, uh, resonance in uh, the left-hand curve here is at roughly uh, two and a half hertz. And then the vertical resonance is roughly three hertz. And it's a natural characteristic of a spring so if you think about a spring, if you're holding a spring that, that has roughly this aspect ratio, you can see that you know, it might be very, very hard for you to compress this spring between your two hands because it might be stiffer. But to bend the, to bend the spring, uh, lay, lay, you know, lay, lay it horizontally and twist it to bend it uh, by providing a torsion from your hands, you know, it might be very, very easy. So what we see with die springs is oftentimes they are much stiffer in the vertical direction than they are in the horizontal direction, and that could really affect performance. Um, this is limited to some extent, or this is controlled by, to some extent by spring aspect ratio. So the more uh, even, uh, the more, the closer your aspect ratio is to one, you know, your, your, the height of your spring to the diameter of it, the closer the two resonant frequencies um, in the other direction will match. So here's the data. And I'll uh, first we'll look at it horizontally. And on the top chart, 
we have a parallel type active system, similar to the uh, where where we have our die spring being a load bearing member, and acting in the same plane as a die spring, we have a linear motor, and both of those are uh, exerting a force on the payload. And remember, the payload is already have its own. It already has its own stage of vibration cancellation, which are those piston style isolators in the frame, which we call the floating column. And we're seeing exactly the kind of behavior that we would expect, especially at low frequencies. The red, we have the floor here at some level below some, some spec line. So here's your floor measurements with some resonances up at higher frequencies. And what we see is the parallel type system doing pretty much what we expected to see that parallel type system doing in, uh, in, in, in the, the transfer function that I had provided earlier. We have some amplification at low frequencies and then better performance in sort of the mid-range, but then additional amplification at higher frequencies, which could be due to a number of factors, uh, but a lot of what is happening here could, could, could be res the result of that sensor being at the payload level, sensing payload noises and payload resonances. And then the third thing to see is the floating column. So we see this amplification of those passive air isolators inside the frame, but they're doing exactly what we would expect. Excellent high frequency isolation, so good that it's canceling out really a lot of this uh, noise up at the higher frequencies. So we're okay here, but we do have this extremely high amplification in the low frequencies. So let's change this to a serial type system. We'll take the same configuration and we'll put it on top of a serial system. And look at the difference that we see between the things. We have roughly the same floor input, and, which is the red line. But the blue line shows the serial type system. And remember, the serial type system is designed to have much higher cancellation at lower frequencies because of the six to mark detector. And we're seeing a much lower level of vibration measure uh, on the serial type system. And then if I look at the green line, I'm also, I am seeing the amplification uh, of those air isolators, but because the, inf the input is so much lower, that re amplification resonance is, is, is even having trouble becoming, taking over, uh, overcoming its own internal forces. And it's, uh, it's, it's really not amp amplifying that much. So let's look at the vertical data. And this is where I want you guys to think about, again, going back to uh, the difference in stiffness between the, 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 the spring in the parallel type system being, uh, 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 being stiffer in the vertical direction than in the horizontal direction. So the stiffer spring in the vertical direction does provide you some less amplification at low frequencies. So we have a softer spring amplifying quite a bit at lower frequencies horizontally, but the stiffness of the vertical spring you benefit from at lower frequencies. And while you're not really, if you're looking at the red line here and you're looking at the blue line here, we can be in the parallel system, you are achieving some level of isolation here. Um, and you know, you're know you getting better in the vertical direction by tuning very, very precisely, uh, but you're not getting much at low frequencies. And if you look at the difference uh, to the, serial, the parallel type, the serial type system, we see a much larger separation between the red and the blue at these low frequencies was what, again, what we're trying to achieve with a low frequency cancellation. And that separation uh, is consistent up until you start to get to higher frequencies where the dominance is acoustics and tool noise and things like that. But again, we're not worried about that uh, dominance of acoustics and frame noise and things like that for two reasons. One, that those things are not feeding into the feedback system of the, of the, of the serial type system, which enables you to get that better performance at low frequencies. But two, that stuff's already taken care of, if I look at the green line, by the tool's internal isolators. So the tool that, that so you really do get that benefit of that second stage. The low frequency cancellation comes from the serial type system, but the high frequency cancellation comes from the tool's own internal isolators. This is an example of a product of ours that, that does this actually very, very well. Um, we have uh, an optical table type product that um, uh, was developed over the years uh, uh, 
in conjunction with uh, with the National Institute, Institutes of Health, which in the old days we had um, a, an active type system over here using our stasis isolators and a platform supporting a parallel, uh, supporting a typical gimbal, gimbal piston style air isolator. But over the years, as we developed this product, we uh, were able to combine those isolation systems uh, into an active first stage and a passive second stage. And the combined transmissibility of these function of these two systems is actually uh, is actually quite good. You get the low frequency benefits of the air isolators, and then you get the high frequency. Uh, I'm sorry of the of the of the piezoelectric active isolators, uh, along with the high frequency benefits of the air isolators of the system at the second stage. So. Let's talk a little bit about stacking active systems on active systems. And the, benef the, the best way, and in fact, uh, to, to, to achieve an act, uh, putting an active system on an active system is by focusing on your separation of stiffness that I mentioned before. And active on active is done very, very commonplace. It's a, it's a, it's a very common occurrence in the semiconductor industry, for example. It occurs in many other places, but the semiconductor industry is really where we see a lot of this. And what we see are instruments that have sort of robotic moving stages on tracks. So here's a wafer, a piece of wafer inspection uh, uh, stage that's gonna move uh, along this track here, and it's gonna have some X, Y motion. It's gonna have some, uh, um, X, uh, some, some, some motion in the X, Y direction. And that stage is going to have some aggressive motion. It's going to start. It's going to stop. It's going to introduce uh, it's a lot of onboard noise, which can be problematic for the performance of that instrument. The manufacturer of these instruments already know that this robotic stage is providing uh, this, inter the, 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 this 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 uh, vibration to their system, so they've used parallel type systems to cancel that noise out. So as I had mentioned before, parallel type systems they sense the motion. On the um, on the payload, they are good at feed forward cancellation, which means you can take the motion of that stage, which you know, you know that stage mass, you know that stage travel, you know the acceleration, and from these things, you can start to feed forward information into the into the system to actually create very very aggressive uh, what's called settling time. So you can actually cancel a lot a lot of that motion very very quickly, which is the goal. And when you place these stages on parallel type systems and you put them on an instrument, you get you uh, you can then take that instrument and put it on a stiff active cancellation system like our Stasis Quiet Island. And what you've effectively done here is you've effectively created um, a two-stage isolation system. In fact, it's almost like a three-stage isolation system because you have your payload here. So up at the very top here, you have your moving stage uh, inside your instrument. And then you have your electro damp or parallel type active cancellation system canceling out the motion generated by that moving stage. You have your platform surface. But then inside your isolator, you have your spring, which is a, a stiff spring and not affected uh, by this payload. Well, it, it's, it's going to settle very quickly due to this payload motion. And any of that noise is going to be filtered out. And then you get to your inner mass supported by your piezos, still keeping this sensor very quiet. So you have this stiffer spring that's mismatched from, uh, from the spring inside here, and you've created effectively this, 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 this two-stage, but really it's a three-stage isolation system where you've got uh, an active system inside the instrument stacked on an active system uh, while supporting the platform underneath, and you're still gaining that low-frequency cancellation from the serial type of stiff architecture. Well, what's another way to do it? Well, uh, what if you wanted to stack a, um, a, a an active system on a, par a parallel type active system on another parallel type active system? Well, it can be done, and it has been done, uh, but you provide you 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 encounter a lot of challenges, and so we have the same configuration we've been talking about here with a moving stage on top of some sort of parallel type active system inside an instrument, and then you place that instrument on, on a platform that uses parallel type active systems. And then the three body diagram looks like this. Sensor on the mass, payload cancellation being performed by feed forward and some feedback through this force actuator, but still 
all sorts of noise is still coming down into this system and then being sensed by this sensor. So whatever this system's trying to do and the, whatever noise the system's trying to cancel, the forces that are being generated are being sensed by this sensor and then being fed into this feedback loop. So you still have the same problem uh, that you have if this was a passive system, if not, and if not worse, because now you've got high forces that are being canceled out to deal with. So your best bet on this on a system like this is to reduce the sensitivity more and more and more of the, of the, of the feedback control loop to avoid the coupling with these two systems. And then finally, well, what if I wanted to try active on passive? Okay, well, um, I no longer benefit from the separation of stiffness as I do from active on a serial type piezo system. So I probably have to reintroduce my, uh, my mass. So it's possible to put this large mass in between a, uh, in, in, in between a, a system with its own internal isolation system and its own, uh, um, I'm sorry, this is the wrong three diagram. This one should have, this three di diagram should also have an actuator here. Um, but uh, you're supported by, by, a, by a, a, a passive spring. So again, you're okay, but you've got a resonant frequency isolator here that's effectively somehow trying to be damped by this actuator that I, that I forgot to add in over here. Uh, you've got your mass here, and you're, that's helping you not have coupling between the two systems, but it's, but you're also doing what we have feared from earlier in the presentation, a similar resonant frequency spring on top of another similar resonant frequency spring. You're going to be summing the resonances of those two if they're similar resonances. So my conclusion, do separate mass for stacking passive systems. So if you're gonna put a passive system on top of a passive system, you can do that by putting a large massive block in between them, but that only gets you so far. You're gonna avoid your oscillation, but you're going to uh, sum the resonant frequencies. You do want to separate stiffness for stacking passive systems on active systems. Okay, but stiffer active systems perform better. So piezo-based stiff elastomer systems uh, will, will, will have that low frequency cancellation that's needed and not interact with the, um, uh, the onboard motion provided by the tool. You do want to stack active parallel systems on stiff serial type active systems. So the bottom line between these two last two do is, yes, you can go ahead and stack any system on top of a, uh, uh, any, a, a passive or an active on top of the next system. But if you're really seeking that performance, and if you really want low frequency cancel cancellation and good stability, the serial type stiff active system is the way to stack them. You don't want to stack active parallel systems on other active parallel systems. You're always going to be at risk of one of the systems having performance issues. And you definitely don't want to stack active parallel systems on passive systems, unless you have a large mass in front of that, uh, uh, a large mass in between the two, but still, you're dealing with a system that is going to have lots of, of its own onboard noise that's not being that 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 that's going that could cause coupling or things like that with the lower passive system. That was all that I had uh, for the uh, uh, for the presentation, and we have about five minutes left, so I'd like to know if there's any questions. Thanks, Mike. Um... Yeah, if you have any questions, um, please type them into the um, question box below and we'll try to get to them. Um, I do have a couple, Mike. Um, <clears throat> first one is, uh, why don't companies like Applied Materials who use parallel systems for motion cancellation just use serial type systems for motion cancellation so they are not sensitive to low frequencies? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, well, you know, with a serial type system is one of the limitations of a serial type system as opposed to a parallel type system is that it's inherently designed not to sense anything on the payload. And because it's not designed to sense anything on the payload, uh, because it has this second stage isolation, let me go back to the free body diagram for a, for a serial type system. 
there's no um, uh, any any payload noise that you might want to cancel out is going to be filtered out into this system. And furthermore, any actuation force isn't going to transfer through to the system. So you really can't provide stage motion cancellation other than whatever settling times offered to you by the elastomer isolator here. Um, so it really can't counteract system noise the way um, a parallel type system can. Good question. Um, okay, thanks. Um, I have another one. Uh, in the case of stacking an active on a piezoactive system, what is the typical maximum mass that the piezo actuator can support? That's a great question. Um, most isolation systems, piezoelectric or otherwise, I should say many, not all, but um, are, 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 um, are modular type systems. So what you have are isolators that have certain that are designed for certain weight capacities, and as you want to increase the amount of weight that's supported by your system, you just you add more isolators. And so um, stasis isolator, for example, which is a piezoelectric uh, serial type system, has a max capacity of uh, 4,500 pounds for one isolator. But we've seen, but if you have an instrument that is 10,000 20,000, 40,000 pounds, uh, you can add more isolators to support larger instruments because each isolator in itself is a self-contained um, uh, 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 feedback control system. Good question. Thank you. Okay. Um, another one. Uh, for a typical cryogen-free cryostat, a major source of vibration is the pulse tubes anchored on top of the cryostat. Will the active isolators work efficiently for this? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a, that's a, we, we, we do see some, um, we do see some cryostat uh, applications. Actually, we, we've done quite a few over the years. Uh, and, you know, that those, the, the pulsing of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a tube like that is a, is a challenging problem to solve. Um, for something like that to solve to, to, to isolate or cancel out that to, that sort of app, uh, that that sort of um, of noise generated by those those types of tubes, you know, the ideal solution it would it would be sort of isolate them with a parallel type system that would sense that noise and then cancel it out by you know then grounding it to uh, by by then you know actually providing an actuator. To, to 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 then um, cancel that that noise near those tubes, um, you get two problems with that. Is that well, that actuator is when that actuator in the parallel system is trying to um, provide that cancellation force, it needs something to push back on. So you've got to have some sort of structure there that's not the cryostat itself to push back on. And second of all, feedback control motion cancellation systems are pretty complicated to to design. So uh, for, for an application where you would be doing a, a one cryostat with one cancellation system, it would be it would be a pretty big project uh, uh, to, to, to do it for that. What I've seen most people do with cryostats are um, are are, are um, uh, 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 is uh, is isolate those moving stages. Uh, completely from the cryostat by uh, by having a structure on top of uh, uh, built around supporting that, that that stage. Okay, so maybe that's a contact TMC. <laughs> uh, that's a really that really is actually we have a we have a cryostat expert here, uh, Brian Keith, uh, who, who would definitely be able to talk to you guys more about that. Okay, um, another one. Yeah, thanks. Um, What's the fastest settling time you have achieved with a stage? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I, you, you can get very, very aggressive. Uh, I'd say most customers are shooting for the uh, like a half second range. Um, I think we've, I'm not sure what we've seen in the lab uh, but uh, uh, cause I, 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 but uh, but I would say that uh, you know industry standard 
is, is probably around half a second. Okay. Um, another one, um, which has a wider, which has wider frequency effective range, passive or active? So, sorry, could you repeat, repeat that, John? It says, uh, which has wider frequency effective range, passive or active? Well, I would say that, uh, that, that that's, it's, it depends on what you mean by effective. Um, so all isolation systems are composed of a passive isolator, for example, uh, is effective uh, at any frequency beyond where its resonance crosses the unit of it, the unity line in the in the transmissibility curve so it's effectively infinitely effective beyond its resonance um a, an active isolation system you've got an active bandwidth of of where that system is sensing um is sensing the frequency range in which your system is sensing sensing and where it is canceling, but then you've got your passive bandwidth, which is going to be the remainder of whatever is um, the transfer function of that passive component of the system, which again goes uh, goes out to infinity. But if you're looking at active systems, you've got an active bandwidth between say half a hertz and some couple hundred hertz. And the question is, well, you might be active in that frequency, but how much gain do you have to achieve reduction within that frequency? And that's where you start getting into system tuning and uh, and and, uh, and and modifications to the control systems. But uh, when we talk about available bandwidth or amount of gain that's achievable within a frequency range, uh, in general. The lower the frequency range that you're trying to uh, to try to solve issues with, uh, the higher amount of cancellation that you can provide in that frequency range. And so you have this constant balance between frequency range and achievable uh, isolation that you could play with. And it's usually between five and 100 hertz, 0.5 and 100 hertz. And the important thing to remember is, in a parallel type system within that bandwidth, you have the resonances introduced by whatever the passive component is, which are reducing your abilities to provide cancellation. Whereas in a serial type system, you don't have that low frequency uh, component that's introducing um, uh, introducing resonances that you need to cancel. So you've got much more effective gain and or bandwidth to play with in that frequency range. Thank you, good question. We have a few more, we're a little over time, but you wanna keep going? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, what if I use an active system on a vast granite block on a table? An active system on a vast black. Uh, uh, well, well, I guess the question is, what you're trying? What are you trying to achieve? Um, you know, uh, it's it's uh, there, that, that's 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 really the question. You know, you could you could put an active system on, on any surface. Um, but the question becomes, what type of active system are you trying to, are you using? And what are you trying to achieve with that active system? And then furthermore, what is, what, what is um, that table that's supporting that granite block? Uh, it's kind of, a, kind of a general question. I'm, I'm afraid I couldn't, um, I couldn't do much more with, the, 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 with this uh, because I'm not exactly sure what we're trying to get to. But, but maybe if you contact us, we can tackle, take, talk a look a little, talk, talk about you know exactly your setup and and uh, you know think about uh, the best way to achieve what you're trying to do. Okay, um, another one, sort of along the same lines. We have a nano indenter instrument which we are thinking of putting on an active vibration isolator, and then over a massive granite block, more than 200 pounds. Do you have any suggestions? Or things we should consider. I'm not sure how big your um, nano indenter is. Um, 
I think that uh, we'd be glad to talk about that with you. Um, if we figured out the mass, you, you know, if we figure out the mass of your nano indenter, uh, we figure out, uh, you know, what what type of surface it's being put on. Uh, but I, I guess the, the the important the advice that I would say that I would give is, um, if you're trying to solve a vibration problem, some of the things that that I didn't talk about in this 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 this, this presentation is. You might want to know what your existing vibration conditions are. So if you had a site survey or anybody in there taking measurements of the floor or the table on which you're putting your instrument, uh, and then you also know from the instrument, the instrument's going to have some sort of installation manual that might uh, tell you what its vibration tolerable limits are, then uh, you can kind of start to figure out, well, you know, if I use this type of isolation system, then I might be able to get into uh, my, 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 my instrument into spec. Um, but if I use a different type, I might not be able to. Um, my, from what I, from what I know about nano indenters, especially if it has its own internal isolation system, uh, your the the stiffness of the system that you put it on is going to be important. So if you're if you're using a granite block, uh, and then putting an active system on top of that granite block, I don't, I don't know. Without knowing much more, you'd probably be better off putting the active system below the granite block. Um, so you can at least have something in there separating the mass. But again, I think it's a little bit more of a complicated uh, system that I that I that I'd love to, you know, uh, you know, get get in touch with you and talk a little bit more about what that what that's going to look like. Um, you know, this is the kind of question that uh, we at TMC we really enjoy chatting about, and we'll, we'll we've got a team of applications and engineers here that you know we'll we'll get on a screen share with you, we'll exchange some drawings, and we'll we'll look at your data and look at what we're trying to achieve. And, and figure out the best uh, application, but that's a that's a really good starting point. Okay, um, that was it for questions. Um, I just want to thank everybody for attending, and um, the webinar will be um, available as a recorded webinar. You know, if you want to watch it again or share it with your colleagues. So thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, sure. Thanks, John, and thank you everybody for joining. We appreciate uh, you taking the time uh, to spend with us here today. All right. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye.